Welcome everyone to 2019 AppGradCon. Hope everyone is uh, well caffeinated as we got a couple of great, exciting talks coming up here. Uh, I'll be giving the warm up talk, uh, as Julia said, and uh, I'll be going over kind of the background for those who aren't used to these warm up talks. They're a background to kind of prepare you for the slightly more technical talks that you'll see. Uh, this will be themed loosely on the concept of astronomy and astrochemistry. Uh, so we may bounce around a little bit, um, and so uh, yeah, we can get started. So to start, this is uh, the schedule for what we're going to be seeing for these next few talks. Uh, so I'll be, you know, we're in the middle of the warm-up talk right now, and then we have uh, three talks, uh, and then we're going to have a break. For the break, everyone's just going to go outside, um, right out there where the tables are, where there will be some refreshments, presumably. Uh, then we'll have two more talks, and then uh, we're going to have the lightning talk, so anyone who uh, is currently presenting a poster. Uh, think of your elevator pitch. You have about a minute, and then we'll cut you off with a loud, annoying noise. Uh, so prepare to uh, uh, have your elevator pitch for uh, talking about it. And then after that, we're going to have a SciComm panel. Um, and so we're going to have some people come up. We'll have about four speakers up here. So also, if you want to have any major burning questions about science and science communication, uh, think about those questions now, um, I guess, while I'm talking. Um, or during the break. Um, beyond that, I don't think there's any other major announcements. Um, so I guess we'll get started. Uh, so it's early in the morning, uh, and some of us may be jet lagged. So I wanted to start off with this quick little uh, YouTube uh, clip, uh, because this is what I do when I'm bored. Um, so to start off, we're just going to go and summarize all of uh, what I'm going to be talking about in about 90 seconds by, uh, if anyone knows, Bill Wirtz. Uh, he did a nice summary of all this with the history of the world. I guess. Uh, you're a rock floating space. Pretty cool, huh? So much water. I should know so much water. I can't even get from here to there without buying a boat. It's sad. I'm sad. I miss you. How did this happen? A long time ago, I should never. And also now, nothing is nowhere. When? Never. It makes sense, right? Like I said, it didn't happen. Nothing was never anywhere. That's why it's been everywhere. It's been so everywhere, you don't need aware. You don't need to be aware. That's how angry it gets. At this, I want to be something, go somewhere, do something. I want things to change. I want to invent time and space. And I know it's possible because everything's here. That probably already happened. I just don't know when to start. And that's exactly where it started. I'm positive. There's a universe now. There's a bit of art and stuff. Oh, that's a thing. In a place. Don't like it. Try a new place. At a different time. Try six together because the world's going to get bigger and emptier. But it's not empty yet. It's still very full. There's about a jillion degrees. Great news. Quarks are now happily married in groups of three called a proton or a neutron. And there's something else flying around too that wants to join in but can't because it's still too hard. Great news. Protons and neutrons are happily married to each other. Something you can tell about. Great news. The electrons are now joining in. Congratulations. The world is now a bunch of gas in space. Let's get closer together. And stay closer together. So anyways, this continues for the next 20 minutes. You shall watch it if you don't have some time. <laughs> so uh, we're going to take this a little bit slower now uh, to go through the full story, but I figured you'd all appreciate it, at least something to wake you up in the morning. All right, so uh, we're going to skip over all the Big Bang cosmology stuff, because that's not what we're here to talk about. And we're going to start with uh, the concept of ooh, blacking out the screen or star formation. Um, so this is a, a kind of classic picture that you'll see of this stellar life cycle uh, uh, for how stars form and how uh, the planets around them will form. So often you start, uh, we kind of reset star formation every time at the death of some star uh, where you have some sort of supernova either um, or some sort of large expansion of the loss of atmosphere. And as the material spreads out into the interstellar medium, it forms these large clouds uh, that tend to be rather uh, dense and dark, and slowly over time, gravity will collapse and form protostars, and around those protostars, material will tend to accrete, and they will start to form large disks. And in these disks, you'll start to coalesce little pebbles, and in those pebbles will eventually build up into things such as planets and comets and meteorites, and... Uh, but slowly, that, uh, those pebbles start to accrete, and you form a star, and around that star, you form things like planets, which is very exciting. And so this, uh, this session is also kind of themed on uh, uh, astrochemistry as well. 
And so uh, the reason I pulled this one up in particular is because chemistry happens throughout this entire process. So you start and you form your initial elements over here in the depths of stars or in the cores of stars through fusion. And so one thing that astrochemistry seeks to answer is how do you go from these elemental ashes, ashes and you build up all the way, you know, you can build up things like buckyballs and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are these large multi-aromatic kind of amorphous species, uh, long linear carbon chain molecules up to more saturated species, things that kind of resemble a little bit more of what we see in terrestrial. But chemistry is happening the whole time. So how do you go from these elemental ashes all the way up to the ingredients we see kind of in the primordial solar system or perhaps afterwards? Um, so you start with your initial ingredients. So uh, I mentioned that uh, a lot of these elements are fused uh, either through the deaths of stars or through uh, in the cores of uh, active stars. So this is kind of a nice little periodic table showing all the different uh, sources of how they're formed. But by and large, the vast majority of things hydrogen with a little bit less is helium, and then just a couple percent is everything else. Uh, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen tend to dominate, dominate a lot of the chemistry there. Um, and the final products that we know about uh, a lot of them are really exciting. You know, when we go to look towards uh, things in our solar system, either when we, you know, with the Rosetta missions, looking at comets or the Merchant Meteorite, we see things like amino acids, these kind of building blocks of how we build up more complex things. Uh, I am not a biologist in training, so, or I'm not a biologist whatsoever. The last time I took a biology class was sixth grade. But people tell me this is very important, and uh, so I believe them, and I try to build this stuff. Uh, when I'm running uh, my research, which is focused on astrochem. Uh, but also then you build up this concept of primordial soup, which is if you get enough complex molecules in one place and you add a bunch of energy to it and do a lot of things that sound really hard, eventually life will just kind of pop out, um, which will obviously be talked in a lot more depth. But uh, the question is, how, do you, how does this all get here in the first place? And how do we constrain the chemistry to go from elemental ashes to amino acids? Um, so in astrochem, there's kind of three major branches and that we, uh, kind of dictate the studies. You know, we talked about these sub-regimes uh, uh, last night. So you have the observational components. This can either be going and observing on a telescope, either space-based or on the ground, or it can be actually sending something out to something in the solar system and taking measurements that way. Uh, you have theory. A lot of this uh, in the interstellar medium will be astrochemical modeling. Um, but a lot of this is done for in the atmospheres of planets and moons as well. Um, these are kind of dominated by either Monte Carlo models or kinetic rate equation models to simulate the chemistry and the physical conditions. And then also you have the laboratory component, which will, uh, from the astronomy side, measure the frequencies uh, for molecules for us to detect in space. They also try to recreate astrophysical conditions. Uh, however, that is rather tough, as a lot of them will definitely tell you. The most powerful uh, high-power vacuums, uh, the least dense you can possibly get, is considered extremely dense in space. So we're talking, you know, 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 6 parts per cubic meter is considered a dark cloud, uh, compared to about 10 to the 19 uh, parts per cubic centimeter is uh, the air we're breathing right now. Um, and uh, so our talks are going to kind of bounce around between a lot of these different subjects. Um, so, for example, on the laboratory side, we're going to have a talk by uh, Haley here about measuring the rotational spectra of molecules in order to complete the inventory of what we know is in space. For us to really understand the full story of astrochemistry, we need to understand what all is there. And as you get to larger and larger molecules, it gets harder and harder to detect them. So we need really accurate spectra to in, there, to in order to determine that. So we'll have a nice talk about that. Um, and so this is, uh, just to kind of guide your eye, this is every single molecule as of about last year. Uh, I didn't get an updated table because uh, that would have taken a while. Uh, but this is uh, a little over 200 molecules have been detected in the interstellar medium. And so we're actually starting to get a really good idea. But you can also see that this is very much dominated by these small, very small two to three atom molecules. Uh, in astrochemistry, you consider complex to be about six atoms. Um, and if you look over here, uh, it, once you get up to about twice that, 12, uh, the number gets quite dwindling. So it'll be very exciting as we get more improved spectra and uh, it's kind of a concerted effort to try to fill this out a lot more. Uh, there was also a good amount of theory talks here, uh, some more or less related to astrochemistry or just kind of chemistry 
uh, in general, both uh, seeking to explain the observations that we see uh, in, for example, in the atmospheres of Titan or what we see in Enceladus. Um, but also we have uh, trying to predict uh, the reactions that we expect to happen as well. So, you know, we'll have some nice talks by Ryan and Aline here, uh, as well as um, we'll just focus on these right now. Uh, so uh, here are the uh, two of the talks will at least be tentatively related to Titan, uh, the other one being related to a different moon of Saturn, uh, which is Enceladus. So here we have uh, Titan is uh, a particularly interesting uh, source for us because it's uh, kind of the one of the it's unique among moons in the solar system in that it has a very rich nitrogen atmosphere, as well as having um, a lot of complex organics we know exist uh, in the kind of uh, methane-rich uh, atmosphere. And as you go down, and this is a nice image from Cassini showing both the uh, optical and also the, uh, an infrared image looking at more of the surface here. And it's going to be particularly interesting going forward, given the uh, Dragonfly mission, which just got selected to be uh, approved. So this will be a really exciting mission. So stay tuned for the exciting results coming out of that. And then we're also going to have uh, a talk that's going to be more related to Enceladus, which is another uh, moon of Saturn. Uh, this one is known for having uh, this large, uh, this ice crust here, the layers not to scale, uh, but these large hydro uh, hydrothermal uh, vents uh, that launch uh, uh, material out into the uh, surrounding area. And in here, there's actually been some very exciting work of finding complex, potentially the first kind of primordial soup potentially found outside of Earth uh, that may have been found in these vents. So that's another really exciting avenue uh, that I will be talking about uh, as well. And we're also going to have a talk about uh, SETI. I didn't really have a great transition here, but we're going to have a SETI talk. And it, uh, this is also really exciting. Uh, these are, uh, so the question is, uh, this is the search for extraterrestri extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, and a big initiative has been pushed uh, for SETI with the Breakthrough Listen project, um, where $100 million is being put in to try to search for intelligent signals uh, somewhere you know, in our galaxy or in other galaxies. And so they're recruiting um, kind of some of the most powerful radio telescopes we have available, especially on the low frequency end. This is the Green Bank Telescope, the largest steerable object on land. The only thing bigger that you can steer are uh, aircraft, aircraft carriers and oil tankers. Uh, for scale, uh, that's a building. Um, it's really big. You don't realize it's big until you actually like physically are like touching it. Uh, and this was the site of a PWR two years ago, which was kind of cool. Um, but there's a series of other radio telescopes here. Uh, this is Meerkat. This is the Park 64 meter. Um, this is on the Lick Observatory, I believe. Um, and also some uh, work with LOFAR as well. Um, and so what this is doing is monitoring mil um, around a million stars and actually be able to also monitor about 100 galaxies looking for these kind of intelligent signals and trying to determine you know, what, uh, uh, what do, the, and a lot of the effort will go into, okay, what, what kind of signal will this look like? And how do we want to, you know, if we want to look everywhere, we need to really figure out what exact type of signal we're looking for. So that's what we're going to get a talk from Sophia uh, about how do we specifically determine our exact uh, drift rates uh, in terms of how much frequency shifting we're going to be getting um, from any given SETI signal. Um, what would we kind of expect? Um, so yeah, that's that's the most of my talk here. Um, I would say definitely one great part about this conference is if you don't know or didn't catch it, please ask. This is the time to ask the questions that you were too afraid to ask because everyone here is super friendly and we all just want to know, you know, I said I know nothing about biology and so uh, most of this I'm going to try to see if I can learn more while I'm here. But please don't be afraid to ask. It's a very friendly group. Um, and I guess I'll take any questions. Uh, yeah, thanks.